Are we ready? Yes? Thumbs up? Go. So, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I stand between you leaving and here right now, so I'm going to try to make this as compact as I can. Um, you've heard a lot of information, and there are a lot of organizations and resources that help with homeschooling. By the way, how many of you here tonight are either currently homeschooling or interested in homeschooling? Most of you, but not all of you. Uh, any charter school families in here? Like both. Both? So like the in Richmond? Okay, gotcha. Yeah, an alternative kind of school. Yeah. All right. Any private school uh, families in here? A couple of private school. Okay. So <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about is a, a curriculum that we've put together. Uh, let me get to it here. And I'm going to leave it sit right here. There it is. We do not focus on all subject matters. <clears throat> We're focused on one subject matter, like a laser beam. And that's the subject matter of civic education. Because it's the one subject matter that really influences our lives. It matters for all of us because what all of us and our kids and our grandkids think about this country, this government, our laws, affects all of us. All of us have skin in this game when it comes to the subject of civic education. And it turns out it's not as simple as it is in many disciplines, in many subject areas, to go out and just get the facts. Because it turns out a lot of people in that realm of civic education, government education, political education, have all kinds of vested interests in how that material is presented. And so it's hard sometimes to find the truth. It's hard sometimes to find out uh, what people in the past who have shaped this government, who have shaped our laws, what they thought, what they meant, what their intentions are. So we've put together an online curriculum called the Political Science of the American Founding. My background is in the academic world. Uh, my PhD is in political science. I've taught at places like Claremont McKenna College out in California. I taught at Hillsdale College in Michigan. Uh, I've taught at George Mason University in Virginia. Now I live in Denver, Colorado, and I'm running a couple of businesses doing, among other things, packaging curriculum in ways that are helpful for families trying to provide a sound and solid education for their kids. At the heart of this class is original source materials. Uh, when I was teaching in college classrooms, I did extensive research on textbooks. And my grand conclusion, pardon my French for the children in the room, my grand conclusion was that textbooks tend to suck. They really suck because usually most textbooks, they're written by third and fourth and fifth rate minds trying to describe what some rather brilliant people did at certain moments in time. And, and therefore, I, I have found it to be much more effective to encourage students to confront the actual people in history, confront their words, confront their actions, try to understand them as those people understood themselves, rather than, rather than trying, uh, going through some textbook and relying on some academic who might have some axe to grind. I'll give you one example. Uh, years ago, when I was in, uh, out in Claremont, California, we did a big multi-year project reviewing high school and college textbooks. And I will never forget, there was one textbook written, it had three co-authors. And this textbook was on American history and government. It was meant to be used in like social studies classes, things like that. And it mentioned George Washington one time. And it had a little picture of him. And under the caption, mentioned that George Washington was one of the slave owners in the United States. And it was the only piece of information presented in this textbook. I mean, that's true. George Washington did, in fact, own slaves. 
He was also known as the indispensable man to make the revolution go, to make the revolution successful. There were all kinds of young soldiers who would not have fought for anyone else, but they would fight for George Washington because they loved and trusted that man. That's, that's what I'm talking about when you rely on textbooks, the kind of information that you might end up with. It's one of the reasons we focus on original source materials. And in just a few minutes here this evening, I want to give you a taste. I want to tickle your palate a little bit, so to speak, about what can be gleaned from original source materials. All of you have, I believe, this little handout in front of you, which is part of this online curriculum. Now when you think about the American Revolution, the American founding, can you think of anything controversial that usually attends those discussions of the American founding, the American Revolution? The central document of the American Revolution was the Declaration of Independence. And what is the most famous statement in the Declaration of Independence? We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, right? Everybody knows that line. And yet that line is the source of tremendous controversy to this day. And there are textbooks and teachers and entire graduate seminars devoted to the idea that, well, when the founder said all men are created equal, they clearly didn't mean black people. They could not have meant black people because there were slaveholders among them. Well, does anyone recall who the principal author of the Declaration of Independence was? Thomas Jefferson, right? Thomas Jefferson, you know, this guy, Jefferson, when he died, on his tombstone, he wanted to be remembered for three things. Now this was a guy who was twice elected President of the United States, and he didn't think that was worth being on his tombstone. He didn't think that was a very important thing. What he did want to be remembered for was the author of the Virginia Statute of Re Religious Liberty, because religious freedom was really important to Jefferson. He despised and loathed the wars of religious persecution that had been going on in Europe for hundreds of years prior to the American Revolution. The second thing is he wanted to be remembered for founding the University of Virginia because he thought education was the key to the future of the United States. And the third thing was author of the Declaration of Independence. What I've given you on this first page down at the bottom, <clears throat> uh, this is from Jefferson's original rough draft. For those of you who don't remember, the Second Continental Congress, when they made the decision for independence, they said, this is it. They had been fighting the British for over a year. So the, the war had been going on, but up until July 1776, the idea was, of the colonists, they were looking for a redress of their grievances. They still thought of themselves as British. As late as February and March of 1776, General Washington, when he would convene with his officers, they would begin by toasting the king, still thinking of themselves as English subjects. <clears throat> well, when the time came for independence, the Second Continental Congress said, we want to declare to the world the purposes, the reasons, the justification for our revolution. They, they didn't need to do that, right? They could have just picked up their guns and gone and shot government soldiers. They did that too, but they also explained in a document why they thought justice was on their side, why they thought they were fighting for freedom and justice is on the side of freedom. And they assigned this task of writing a document to a committee of five people that included both Jefferson and John Adams. And John Adams went to Tom Jefferson and said, Tom, you need to write this draft because I'm John Adams and number one, you're ten times a better writer than I am and that had to pain John Adams because he had this enormous ego. And number two, he said, I'm kind of a prickly butthead and people hate me. I have so many enemies out here. I can't write this declaration. People will reject it just if my name is on it. So you, Tom Jefferson, you need to write it. So Jefferson writes the first draft. And what I've given you on the bottom of page one is from his original draft. 
Now you remember the middle part of the declaration. It was all the grievances against the king, right? All, all those sentences that begins, he has, the he is King George III. This is far and away the longest grievance that Jefferson penned against the king. Let us read it together. He has way, he, King George III, has waged cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty in the, per in the persons of a distant people who never offended him, captivating and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere. Right? Who is that, who is that distant people who are being captured into slavery who never offended the king? Africans. Africans had never done anything to King George and yet he is authorizing their capture and their transportation to other parts of the world as slaves. Uh, this piratical warfare, let's just read this and I'll comment on it. This piratical warfare, the opprobrium of infidel powers is the warfare of the Christian king of Great Britain. Determined to keep open a market where men should be bought and sold, he has prostituted his negative for suppressing every legislative attempt to prohibit or to restrain this execrable commerce. And that this assemblage of whores might want no fact of distinguished die, he's now exciting those very people to rise in arms among us and to purchase that liberty of which he deprived them by murdering the people on whom he also obtruded them, thus paying off former crimes committed against the liberty of one people with crimes which he urges them to commit against the lives of others. All those capitalized words, those are Jefferson's capital letters. Notice he describes the King of England as a pirate. This piratical warfare. I love that phrase. What is, what is a pirate? I mean, yeah, there's pirates of the Caribbean, right? And uh, what, what's his name? Um, Johnny Depp is really groovy and, you know, good looking. But what really is a pirate? A pirate is a thief who does his work on the water. And Jefferson here is saying, George III is nothing but a pirate. He steals people and ships them on the water. More importantly, he also points out the irony, right? George III is not only the king of England, he's also the head of what powerful, important institution in England? The Church of England, right? This Christian king, the head of the Christian church, this is what he's doing. He is uh, determined to keep open a market where men are bought and sold as if they're property, but they're not property. What does he call the beans being bought and sold. They're men. Go back to that famous second sentence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Who's being bought and sold as slaves? Does Thomas Jefferson understand that these are human beings that we're talking about? Absolutely he understands it. In fact, if you turn over to page 2, and, and, and feel free to take these with you. You might enjoy some of these readings on your own. Um, number 9, down at the bottom of page 2. This is <clears throat> Jefferson. Uh, Jefferson wrote one book, The Notes on the State of Virginia. And the, the cause for that book, the impetus for that book, is immediately after the Revolution. The, the Revolution was an embarrassment to Europe, right? Really to all of Europe, because all of Europe were colonial powers. They had little colonies all over the world. England did, France did, Spain did. And one of those little colonies just beat the pants off of the most massive Im empire in the world. They took on the greatest army and navy and sent them running back across the Atlantic, sailing across the Atlantic. <clears throat> and so one of the ways that Europeans responded uh, was to say, fine, let the Americans have their independence. It
It's so miserable over there. There's disease and death everywhere. Their cows are skinny and don't have any meat on them. Their rivers don't have any water or fish. It's miserable. Let them have their independence. So Tom Jefferson, being a man of enlightenment science, he goes around and starts measuring things. If you open up the notes on the state of Virginia, it's a weird looking book because it's filled with all these tables and charts and numbers. And what he's doing is he goes out and he measures the volume of water running in an American river and compares that to the volume of water in an English river. He goes out and weighs American cows and compares them to British cows. And by the way, he finds out that American cows are actually bigger and heavier and fatter and have more meat on them than the English cows. It's in this spirit of scientific observation that Jefferson confronts the question of white and black equality of talents. He says there's, there's great dispute. Are white people and black people equal in their talents? And so he goes and he observes slaves on his plantation. And he writes about it. He says, well, they, they tend not to excel at things like mathematics and, and, and right, the, theoretical sciences. Uh, they tend to be musical. Uh, he, he describes in detail how they live on a day-to-day -day basis. And a friend of his sends a book of modern uh, sociological, anthropological research on African people. And this is Jefferson's response. Jefferson says, <clears throat> quote, be assured that no person living wishes more sincerely than I do to see a complete refutation of the doubts I myself entertain and expressed on the grade of understanding allotted to black slaves by nature, and to find that they're, in this respect they are on a par with ourselves. My doubts were the result of personal observation on the limited sphere of my own state where the opportunities for the development of their genius were not favorable. Gross understatement, right? I mean, you're living as a slave. Yeah, maybe that's why they're not excelling at theoretical mathematics and physics, right? But notice this next sentence. But whatever be their degree of talent, right? Whatever be their degree of talent, it is no measure of their rights. Because Sir Isaac Newton was superior to others in understanding, he was not, therefore, the lord of the person or property of others. So his point is, I don't know if black people and white people are equal in all regards. I don't know. You'd have to do more observing and measurement to, to, to know that. But whatever the answer is, it's no measure of rights. They're human beings, which means they have the exact same natural individual rights that every other human being is. I'm a student, I'm a scholar of the American Civil War. And what happened in this nation is remarkable because it had never happened anywhere in the world. Never had a group of people declared independence upon this principle of universal human equality and then fought and sweat and bled to get rid of this institution of legalized slavery within four score and seven years of the declaration to use Lincoln's dating at the Gettysburg Cemetery. Nowhere. It is it is mind-boggling the swiftness of that anti-slavery movement. Uh, one, one, of the, one of the ways I describe it in, in our online curriculum is from the period of 1776 up through 1800. This is 24 years. Do you know that in 24 years the Americans stopped the spread of slavery to new territory? They stopped the importation of slaves through the Atlantic slave trade. They isolated slavery where it existed, and they abolished it in more than half the states. That little time period was the greatest anti-slavery movement in all of human history. When you think of, think of Europe, and ask yourself the question, how long did it take the English 
to start to think slavery is a problem and we better get rid of it. Uh, that would be about 900 years. Think of this, 900 years. The French took 1,300 years. The ancient great civilizations, the Greeks, right, were brilliant at many things. They gave us Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. And it never occurred to them that slavery is fundamentally wrong and we ought to get rid of it. The Romans built the aqueducts. Really smart scientists, right? Those Romans. And yet they didn't think slavery's wrong and we ought to get rid of it. And here these Americans are. Right? And getting rid of slavery isn't the only challenge in front of them. They, they first have to win a revolutionary war against the greatest army and navy and create a new regime and embed things like private property rights, religious freedom, individual freedom, and get rid of this institution because every one of the important thinkers acknowledged it's wrong, slavery's wrong, because the idea of our Declaration of Independence is right. It is a self-evident truth that every human being has a natural right to their own person and their own property. Therefore, slavery has to be wrong. This subject that sometimes I worry is, is, is almost tearing this country apart. Watch what happens. Whenever there is an incident that involves race, that is public, that's newsworthy, where does it go? Where do the conversations, where do the discussions, where do the fights instantly go? Well, this nation is a racist, terrible nation because of its legacy of slavery. And a lot of, I think a lot of Americans are shamed into not talking about this subject. I'm here to suggest, as educating parents, as parents who are deeply involved, you're, you're, you're willing to be sitting here at 7.45 at night, so you're really invested in your kids' education, and thank you for that. As you educate your kids, encourage them, inspire them to talk about this subject, to learn about this subject. This is a subject nobody in the United States should be ashamed of this subject. We should be talking about it all the time because this country did something no other nation had ever done in all of human history. And it's a rather remarkable story. I'm going to leave you here with a, 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 a couple more quotations. Look back on page one. <clears throat> I, I, I will say this before we read these brief quotes. I've been studying this stuff for 25 years. I've read thousands of pages of original source material from the founding period. I have never come across one piece of literature of anyone in that period, 1770s, 1780s, arguing that slavery was a good thing. Not one. Everyone who commented on it said, it is shameful, it's wrong, it's embarrassing, we need to figure out how to get rid of it. Now that story would change when you get into the 19th century. All kinds of things started to change in the 1830s, 1840s, in the period leading up to the Civil War. Not least of which is that cotton becomes really, really valuable. You can make a boatload of money on cotton, and so cotton plantation owners start to look for justifications for slave labor. And they find it. They find that justification. But not in the founding period. Instead, what you find are comments like this. George Washington, I'm on page one. There's not a man living who wishes more sincerely than I do to see a plan adopted for the abolition of slavery. John Adams. Every measure of prudence ought to be assumed for the eventual total extirpation of slavery from the United States. I have through my whole life held the practice of slavery in abhorrence. Franklin, slavery is an atrocious debasement of human nature. Alexander Hamilton, the laws of certain states given ownership in the service of Negroes as personal property, but being men, by the laws of God and nature, they were capable of acquiring liberty, and when the captor in war thought fit to give them liberty, the gift was not only valid, but irrevocable. Madison, we've seen the mere distinction of color made in the most enlightened period of time, a ground of the most oppressive dominion ever exercised by man over man. Uh, Hamilton is worth a couple of comments. Hamilton. Does anyone know the life of Hamilton? Anybody seen the play? I've not seen the play. I've, 
You, I, I have too. Actually, I have the soundtrack. It's it's great music. Yeah, I, I encourage if you, those of you have not heard the music from Hamilton, the Broadway musical. Download the soundtrack. It's fantastic. It's based on a, an absolutely gorgeous biography of Hamilton titled simply Hamilton by Ron Chernow, who's a historian. I, I know Ron. I've been on a panel with him before. Hamilton comes from utter squalor and poverty. Little island in the Caribbean. Never knows his father. In fact, just, just to give you a sense of his upbringing, his mother did not know who his father was. Okay? She dies when he's nine years old. This, he's bouncing around from orphanage to orphanage. He doesn't grow up as a plantation owner or a slave owner. He, he grows up in, in terrible poverty. This guy gets to the United States. Does anyone know how Hamilton got to the United States? A hurricane hits his little island. It, it devastates everything, B blows everything out to the ocean, kills a bunch of people. It's, it's horrific. And in the local newspapers, in the days after the storm, there appear these beautiful poems capturing the dread and the melancholy and the suffering and the fear after this storm. And everyone's reading these poems, being moved, and, and they're all anonymous. And they were thinking, Who, who's writing these gorgeous poems? And it turns out to be a 17-year-old kid named Alexander Hamilton. And the people of that little community, they get together and they say, this kid's got talent. <laughs> this kid's unusual. He should not stay here, bouncing around these orphanages. He needs to go to the United States and go to college. And so they pool their own money together, buy a ticket for him, and send him to New York. That's how Alexander Hamilton gets to the United States when he's 17 years old. And then, at the outbreak of the war, this kid's a teenager. You're all parents. Think of your kids when Hamilton was 18. The British are sailing warships up the East River, right next to the island of Manhattan, which is where he's going to school in, in, at King's College. The British warships are going up, so everyone flees and runs away, except Hamilton. You know what Hamilton does? Hamilton steals a British cannon, drags it up to the roof of his school with some of his friends, and is up there, boom, shooting, <laughs> shooting at these British warships. I mean, how can you not love this guy, right? And Hamilton despises slavery. That little island he grew up on was a slave port. Slave ships would come into port all the time. And he would see the slaves brought off on chains, you know, and, it, and he, he hated it as a kid. He hated it as a young adult. He hated it his whole life. He was one, he, he launched the first abolition and colonization society in New York to get rid of slavery. And I'm convinced that had he lived longer, I don't know that we would have needed a Lincoln. Hamilton might have gotten done what it took Lincoln to get done in the 1860s. The story of Hamilton's death. You know how da Hamilton died, right? That kind of slimy worm, Aaron Burr. And, 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 and I use that with all due respect. <laughs> he was really slimy. The election of 1800 was the most hotly contested presidential election in all of American history. You think 2016 was rough? Go back and look at the election of 1800. It, the incumbent was John Adams being challenged by Thomas Jefferson. And they are calling each other murderers and rapists and, and satanic. I mean, it's off the chart. And because of the original design of the Constitution, there's a tie in the Electoral College between Thomas Jefferson and his own running mate, Aaron Burr. And Aaron Burr says, does anyone recall under the Constitution, if there's a tie in the Electoral College, who decides who's president? The House of Representatives, who said that? Yes, House of Representatives. So Aaron Burr thinks, well shoot, I got just as many votes as Thomas Jefferson. When this thing goes to the House of Representatives, I'm just going to go lobby to get a few more votes and 
I'll be president. Why, why should I settle for vice president? This is when Alexander Hamilton jumps into action. He is no longer in office, right? His mentor, George Washington, is dead, died the year before. And Hamilton starts contacting his friends in Congress. And he says, look, I loathe Thomas Jefferson. I think Thomas Jefferson is wrong on every single important thing. We have been fighting for 10 years consistently. And at least Jefferson's honest. He, 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 what, he, what he says is what he means. I think he's wrong, but he means it. Aaron Burr? Aaron Burr's a scumbag. You can't let this man become president of the United States. And Hamilton is the one who helps turn the election to his arch enemy, Jefferson, because he can't bear to see Aaron Burr become president. Well, how do you think Aaron Burr responds to this? He's not happy. So what does he do? He challenges Hamilton to a duel. And in that day, that sounds silly to us today, but at that time, dueling basically was life or death in the sense of if you didn't, if you didn't respond to a duel, you had no credibility, no respectability. You were cowardly, you were untrustworthy, no one's gonna do business with you, no one's gonna interact with you. You have to respond to a challenge to a duel. So they go to the place to, for the duel. Hamilton's there. The duel's gonna be with a, uh, handguns. They do whatever, you know, they walk the 10, 15 paces, whatever it is, and they turn. And Hamilton, aims at Burr, and it goes like this, poof. And he's sending a signal. He's saying, I'm Alexander Hamilton, I'm willing to come out here after being challenged to a duel, and I'm not a murderer. I'm not going to shoot you. And Aaron Burr points his gun and blows a hole right through the middle of Hamilton. Hamilton dies there. We lost, we lost one of the greatest anti-slavery activists and advocates in all of human history in that butchery of Alexander Hamilton. And so that work of getting rid of slavery across the United States, it would be postponed for two generations until Lincoln and the Civil War. But this story of what the Americans did, it is riveting, it is filled with drama, it's beautiful. It's the kind of story we should be talking to our kids about. It's at the heart of the political science of the American founding. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them, but thank you all very much for your time tonight. <clears throat>